do more drug cooperation with Mexico, the negative negates that proposition. It says, no, we should not be, we should not do drug cooperation with Mexico. Right? And likewise, if the affirmative says we should cooperate with Cuba over energy, the negative team says, no, we should not. We should not do energy cooperation. Right? Negatives negate. Pretty simple stuff. Right? And they can negate to a variety of mechanisms, right? Which we will discuss later in the power presentation. There is not one way to negate. Right? It's not just like uh uh to a young uh Right? There is uh uh one and uh uh two and we agree, but not that way, right? There's a variety of ways that you can negate. We're going to go over those in a little bit, right? Regardless, being negative requires lots of attention, right? Every trade term you go to, you know you're going to be affirmative at least half of the time, right? And presumably, you know you're affirmative pretty well because that's something that you debate half of the time. Fifty percent of all your debates will be on the AF, right? And your AF is something that you choose, it's something that you research, it's something that you know, right? And so you are pretty much an expert with regard to your affirmative. Right? But do you know who you're going to be debating on the negative that every term you go to? Most of the time you don't, right? You might know the teams that are there. You might have an idea of who you could debate potentially, right? but you never really know who you're going to be round two if you're negative, or who you're going to be round four if you're negative, or who you're going to be round five if you're negative. You only have sort of the ability to survey the potential teams you can debate. Right? And so there's a lot of uncertainty facing you on the negative. Right? There might be 20 teams you can be negative against. Right? And that's a lot to prepare for. And that's something you've got to keep in mind when you're preparing for the negative, right? It requires a lot of attention, it takes a lot of uncertainty, and because of that, you can't negate the same way every round, right? When you're saying no against a Mexico affirmative, right, the type of no, right, or the type of arguments you make against that Mexico affirmative are fundamentally different from, most of the time, from what you do when you're negating against a Cuba F. Why? Because Cuba is not Mexico, right? There's obviously some differences. Right? So there's a lot to think about and a lot to worry about right, um, on the negative, and part of today's lecture is helping you figure all that stuff out. Right? So up here I put some key terms, right? um, and these are just sort of like things I'm going to mention right, over the rest of the slideshow. Right? And I'm going to briefly describe them now, um, but there are terms that are related to the negative, the negative strategy that you need to kind of keep in mind. Right. First is presumption. Now, my lab, we had a little bit of discussion about this yesterday, but uh, I just want to sort of ask you, what does presumption mean in the context of debate? Slow morning. Oh, you have that question? Yeah. What does presumption mean in the context of debate? Presumption is the way you have to prepare for it. Not exactly. Yeah? If everything is equal in a round, you go for the least um, necessary departure from the status quo. Okay, so there's a sort of notion that it's sort of we're, uh, reluctant to embrace change. Now, let me ask you this. So, as human beings, are you, do you like when things change, or do you kind of like, you know, sticking with your normal routine? <laughs> Most people stick with their normal routines, right? You go to the same restaurant, you go to the same school, you go to the same house, you go to the same parents every day. Right? How weird would it be that if every day you went to a different house that you called home? That'd be cool. Right? For some people like Deontay, awesome, because you might hate your parents or whatever. Right? But for most people, that's like way too much change, and we can't do that. Right? Imagine if you lived in a different town every day of your life. Crazy, right? It's too much change. Right? And so humans in general have a presumption against change. Right? Because change is risky. Right? Sometimes change is beneficial, but oftentimes it's uncertain. We don't know whether change will be a good thing or bad. Right? And for a lot of people, uncertainty, mm -hmm. like we'd rather know what we have than risk not knowing what the future pertains. Right? And so presumption, right, it's sort of related to that human notion of being reluctant to embrace change. In the context of debate, if the affirmative team fails to really make the case that change is necessary, the negative team can say, hey, vote negative on presumption, because the affirmative has failed to make the case for change. Right? And that appeals to a judge who, faced with uncertainty with change, and certainty with non-change, they'll almost always stick with non-change, because there's certainty with regard to that, and humans generally think that certainty is better than uncertainty. So presumption is a term that deals with change, people's reluctance to embrace it, and the negative team often appeals to presumption when they argue that the affirmative team has failed to satisfy the big conditions to argue that change is necessary. Right? So for example, right? If the affirmative stands up and says, we should give money to Venezuela, but doesn't give a reason why, why should we embrace that change? 
Um, it's hard, right? There has to be a reason to embrace change, right? And absent a reason, we're going to default to our presumption, which is no, right? You haven't given a reason to change. And in fact, the only thing that I think that, that change can entail is lots of money, costs, stuff, and I don't want to do it. Right? So presumption is that term that appeals to people's reluctance to embrace change. Second key term, burden of rejoinder. Have you heard of this before? What? Burden of rejoinder. Okay. <laughs> the burden of rejoinder is the obligation of the negative team to respond to what the affirmative team has said. Okay? So if the affirmative team stands up and says, hey, we should send over agricultural experts to Mexico to help them sustain their farming sector, right? you on the negative have the burden of rejoinder to respond to that specific affirmative. Right? You can't just be like, but Taylor Swift's new hairstyle is awesome. Right? Or Miami's going to win round seven, or, you know, in game seven of the NBA Finals. Like, you can't do that. Right? Your burden on the negative is to respond to what the affirmative has proposed. So when they propose we should send over agricultural experts to Mexico, you have to say, no, we shouldn't. Right? Or, yeah, we agree, but in a different way. Right? Your burden is to respond right, to them. And rejoinder means sort of there's a linkage there. Right? You're obligated to respond in kind. Right? You can't just go rogue, you can't just be like, I'm going to dance. <laughs> right? Because that's not responsive to what they've said. Right? The burden of rejoinder initially lies with the negative. The affirmative team stands up and says, we should do this. And you and the negative have to say, no, we shouldn't, or something related to what they've advocated. Third term is offense. Right? Debate folks, what might my, my that refer to? Offense? Yeah. Like no, you do, like you're um like you're basically giving out the your affirmative and you're giving out like what's going on, like the plan basically. But it, does it only apply to the affirmative? No, it comes from negative as well. Right. And how would it apply to the negative? If they like to do a counter plan. No, not a counter plan, but if they give their um opening speech as well, but it's in the evidence. Okay, so it could be the opening speech, but it might not be. Right? Are there particular types of arguments that you sort of remember as being offense? A disset, right? Why is a disadvantage considered an offense? Because it's an argument from negative and use against the affirmative. Okay, but like I can also use stuff like your advantage is a lie. I can use that against the affirmative, right? Wouldn't it also be considered an offense? No. It's not an answer to an argument they made, it's an, a different argument that you would make in order to make the case. In the okay, think about it this way. Think about offense as saying that someone does something bad. Right? What is offense against eating candy all day, every day? You're no, fat, fat, your health stinks, you get sick, you get pimples. Right? All these are consequences, right? They are reasons not to eat candy all day, every day. Okay? Right? Defense would be something like, there's not enough candy to do that. Or... Eating candy doesn't really affect your health at all. Or there's no such thing as candy. Right? Those would be defensive, right? Defensive arguments sort of say, they challenge the sort of assumptions. They sort of don't say that what the affirmative team or what the other person's saying is necessarily bad, but that it's not true, it's just like not that insignificant, et cetera. Right? And a disadvantage, does it say, oh, the affirmative's not that bad, the affirmative doesn't matter? No, disadvantage say the affirmative does matter. Why? Because they cause bad stuff, right? Right. And so disadvantages are a, a good example of an offensive argument, right? And there are other types of arguments we're going to talk about, the like case terms and critiques, and maybe certain counterplans with net benefits that can be considered offensive arguments as well, right? And using a sports metaphor, right? Typically, right? People say defense wins championships. Well, in debate, defense doesn't win you much, right? Offense is what wins you debates on the negative, right? So you need to kind of keep in mind what this term offense means. 1 and C, 2 and C, 1 and R, 2 and R. What are those? The negative speeches, right? And so the rest of the lecture I'm going to give this morning is going to have specific suggestions for each negative speech, right? And how they can maximize their strategic thinking and to set themselves up to have more success in the, on the negative, right? The block, it's in quotation marks, because that refers to it. It's 2 and C and 1 in R, right? So 
right? Remember, we had the sort of debate structure, right? And that debate structure goes, let's go just Michaela and Boston's lab. What's the structure of policy debate? What's the first speech? Um, O1AC. 1AC, then yeah. what? Then it's a CX. Right, okay, let's just ignore the process. Let's okay. go with the speech. Then it's so. O1NC. 1NC? 2AC. Yeah. 2NC. Yeah. 1AR. Nope. 1 in R, okay, 1 A R, 2 in R, 2 A R, right? In the middle of that debate, right, there's two negative speeches in consecutive right order. Like there's a 2 in C and the 1 in R, right? And we colloquially, colloquially refer to that as the negative block, right? Because there's that block of time, that 13 minutes of time in the middle of the debate where there's no cross X, where, where there is a cross X, but they're right, you know, right in consecutive next to each other. And the reason why we conceptualize that is because right, it's two negative speeches back to back, right? And you want to start to think about that, it's not two separate speeches per se, but it's maybe a singular block of time where you on the negative can really respond to the preceding affirmative speech, which is the 2AC, and then do a lot of damage and make the resulting affirmative speech on ER that more difficult. Right? So in later sort of slides, when you hear the term the block, remember that refers to the 2 and C and the 1 and R. The SHITS, okay? We've talked about that a little bit. Right? Right, solvency is one of the S's. Harms is H, right? That's sort of the affirmative advantages. Inherency. Topicality. Significance. Right? And significance is that sort of like fuzzy thing that's related to the affirmative harms. It's sort of like the so what? Right? Why should we care about the affirmative? Right? That's sort of that. Right? And as we remember, right, the affirmative has to have all five in order for it to demonstrate the change is necessary. Right? The affirmative is just the hits. Right? It's got significance, it's got harm, it's got inherency, it's got topicality, but it's got no solvency. That affirmative can't win because it hasn't met its burden of proof. Right? It hasn't demonstrated that change is necessary and sufficient. Right? So the SHIGS is also something we're going to refer to in a little bit. How to negate? Various ways to do that. The first is to repeat the affirmative. Right? Attack the SHIGS of the F. Right? You can answer those stock issues with the affirmative verbs. Right? You make answers against inherency. You challenge their topicality. You make fun of their solvency. You demonstrate that there are no harms associated with the status quo. Right? And without, if you prove that the affirmative meet, does not meet its affirmative burdens, then you will win if the affirmative doesn't demonstrate the changes necessary. Right? So if you win, the harms don't exist. Right? Let's see you stand up in the 1 and C. And you win that there are no oil spills in the Gulf, right? That US Latin American relations are high now, and China will never threaten Taiwan, even if it becomes close to Latin America. Is there a reason left to vote affirmative? Why would we want to do energy cooperation with Cuba if all the reasons that the affirmative is proposed aren't actually things that exist? There's not, right? There has to be a justification for doing the affirmative. Right? If you prove that the AF lacks a justification, there's no reason to vote affirmative. Right? And that's one thing you can do on the, you know, on the negative. You can respond to the affirmative claims. Right? Or to take another example, let's say the affirmative stands up and says, we should give money to Mexico. Right? And let's say that you in the one NC speech stand up and say, yesterday we just gave a ton of money to Mexico. Why vote affirmative? Right, exactly, right? There's no barrier preventing us from doing the affirmative, right? In fact, it seems like it happened yesterday, right? And why would we want to do something that just happened yesterday? Doesn't make any sense, right? Right? And so all of these things are, you know, options that you have, right, or at least the first singular option on the negative is to refute the affirmative, right? You can basically poke holes, right, in all aspects of the F. Right? And if you win substantial enough or significant number of holes in the affirmative, right, you'll allow yourself to argue that, hey, the affirmative's not met right, the burden of proof. They've not demonstrated the change is necessary uh, because they don't solve the problems they exist, or there are no problems that exist to solve for, or the affirmative's already taken place. Right? If you win all of those arguments, right, you've basically knocked out the affirmative. And you can appeal to the presumption, right, appeal to people's reluctance to embrace change. And as as mentioned here, topicality is an aspect of this, right? Remember yesterday when we talked about topicality, right? If you win, the affirmative is not topical, right? Either not related to the topic, they fail to meet an affirmative burden, 
and they oftentimes can't win those debates. Okay? So first means of negation, refute the affirmative. Second means of negation, defend the status quo. Right? What's the status quo refer to? What's happening now? Right? The existing state of things. Right? Snapshot of now. Okay? You need this. You can defend the status quo. You can prove why the existing state of things is preferable to the world created by the affirmative chain. Okay? The existing state of things is, let's just say, hypothetically, that Miami will win game seven. Why? Because they got momentum from game six. Right? That's existing state of things. Right? Miami's likely going to win now. Right? Swing. Hit LeBron with the car tonight. Right. So if Miami's going to likely win now, and I hit LeBron with the car, what's the likelihood that Miami's going to win game seven? Oh, I'm likely. Okay. But maybe it's a good thing for the world that Miami wins. Because what happens if Miami doesn't win? ESPN will explode. Right. The television will just like blow up like a nuclear weapon. Stephen A. Smith's going to be yelling. Like all these other TV personalities can just go crazy. Right, even the Today Show. We'll spend an hour talking about Miami and how they like, totally show. Right, and is that something that you want to deal with? No. I don't. I, I would rather not have to deal with that. Right, likewise, in the context of debate, the status quo argues that the existing state of things should not be changed. Right, and maybe there's an argument that says, hey, our economy is doing okay right now. Right, we're getting our budget deficit, albeit big, under control. But the plan comes along and spends a lot of money that we don't have. Right? And what happens when we spend a lot of money that we don't have? It hurts our economy. Right? And do we want our economy to be hurt substantially? No. Obviously not, right? So there are consequences associated with that. Right? And instead of go would say, hey, we should just stick with it. Right? The economy's doing okay now. We're managing our funds right now. Right? And the worst thing we can do is to embrace change, in this, in this case, spending a lot of money. Right? And that's what a disadvantage is. Right? Disadvantages are defenses of the status quo. Right? And it's an effective strategy at times, right? but oftentimes difficult to execute, execute. Why, for example, would you only want to talk about your disadvantage in the last negative speech and not really talk about the affirmative at all? Let's say that your two and our speech is only about why the affirmative spends money and why it's bad for the economy. Why might that be tricky in terms of winning a bit? Is there still something else in that debate that you aren't responding to? What about the affirmative itself? Right? You've given reasons why it spends money and why that's bad, but have you really negated all the reasons that the affirmative is given as to why change is good? No. Right? And so whenever you're going for a defense of the status quo, right? whenever you're going to talk about a disadvantage in the last thing of speech, you oftentimes need to do that in conjunction with right, attacks against the affirmative. Right? You need to say not only that the, what the AF does is bad, but the AF doesn't do anything good as well. Right? So not only does the AF hurt the economy because it spends money we don't have, but the AF also doesn't solve anything. Right? Or in addition to the AF spending money that we don't have and not hurting the economy, there is no problem for the affirmative to solve. Right? Or in addition to spending money that we don't have and not hurting the economy, We've already done something similar to the affirmative, thus there's no reason to do it. Right? And so whenever you're going for a defense of the status quo on the negative, it oftentimes makes more strategic sense to say the plan is a bad idea in conjunction with the affirmative doesn't do much, there's nothing to solve for, there's no problem existing for it to address, etc. Right? And so as you can say, defending the status quo means refuting the money sees written exactly of the status quo. Right? You have to say, no, there is no problem. There are no oil spills. There are no arms to relations. In addition to what the affirmative does is bad. So, AF is bad, right? That's a disadvantage. That's a defense of the status quo. But that oftentimes needs to be done in conjunction with AF doesn't do much. Or there's nothing for the AF to do. Or we've already done the AF. Does that make sense? Okay? Right? So you've got an offensive argument, AF is bad, with some defensive responses. AF doesn't do anything, there's nothing for the affirmative to do, etc. Another means of negation, when a counterplan, right? So Deontay, what's a counterplan? 
a plan that basically um, comes up with another plan that will work better. If a plan that comes up with another plan? It's a plan that attacks the affirmative. Who reads counterplans? Either side can read counterplans. Nope. Okay. Negative team. Negative team reads counterplans. And as you mentioned, a counterplan is an alternative policy proposal, right, offered by the negative team to challenge or to compete with the proposal offered by the affirmative. Right? So in your evidence packet, there is a counterplan. That counterplan says what? China. China should do economic engagement with Cuba, Mexico, or Venezuela. Okay. And why would we want to have something like that? Because maybe the U.S. isn't necessary for doing economic engagement with these countries. Maybe it's a better idea to have someone else, like China, do economic engagement. Can the NEG bring in counterplan or 2 and C? Generally, yes. Right? Um, because the 2 and C is still a constructive speech. But there are theoretical objections to doing so. Right? And uh, you know, when we talk about counterplans more in depth, maybe later today or tomorrow, we can have a more intensive discussion. But think about it this way. Right? Why might it be a bad thing for today for 2 and C's to introduce counterplans in the 2 and C? Because they could use Why? Yeah. Alright, so there's that. Right? Remember argument development, decision making stuff that we talked about in the lab? It's really hard to develop arguments well if they're introduced so late in the game, right? And so that might be a reason why two and two counter plans are bad. But, right, do you still have the ability to respond to a two and two counter plan in the one year? I mean, yeah, but you have like five minutes to cover the 13 minutes. It's tough, right? So there's a theory debate to be had. But in general, yeah, you can. But my suggestion is that if you do have a counter plan, you probably want to put it in the one and Just to allow sufficient argument development, right, over the course of the debate. Right, so we have our counterplan, right, and counterplans function by saying what has been advocated by the negative team, in this case the China counterplan, China economic engagement, is better than the proposal offered by the affirmative. I.e., it's better that China give economic assistance to Cuba than the United States does. Why? Because it avoids disadvantages, right? It doesn't hurt Obama politically, it doesn't alienate China by stepping on their sphere of influence. It doesn't spend money that the U.S. doesn't have, etc. Right? You can win a counterplan. Right? And counterplans say the policy proposed by the negative team is superior in some way, shape, or fashion than what is presented by the affirmative. Right? Winnable counterplans, i.e., counterplans that can win you debates, right? do the following things. A. They solve for most, if not all, of the affirmative arms claims. Right? So when you read the China counterplan against the Cuba affirmative, you need to have arguments as to why the China counterplan solves for oil spills. Right? Because that's like part of the affirmative. Right? And why else would you read a counterplan if it doesn't address any of the things that the affirmative is proposed? Right? B, it has to compete with the affirmative. Right? And competition refers to what? Nope. Nope. Counterplan competition. Why? Right, so opportunity costs, right, we talked about that. But the two things, right, there's mutual exclusivity, which refers to what? The plan and the counterplan can't happen. Can't do the same thing, right? I've got five bucks, right? I can spend it at Chipotle, or I can spend it at Chick fil A. Is five bucks going to get me anything in Chipotle and Chick fil A? No, because it's a finite resource, right? I spend it in one place, I can't spend it in the other. Right, there's mutual exclusivity there, right? I can't go to the store and not go to the store at the same time. It's like, not possible, right? I can't be in Athens and in Singapore at the same time. He's not yet. Okay. Right. So there's that mutual exclusivity. Right. If you went there, fundamentally incompatible. Right. That's one way to demonstrate the counterplan is competitive. And the second notion of competition is net benefits. Right. That there is a benefit that the counterplan enjoys over the plan. Right. The China counterplan solves the affirmative, and it's not beneficial because it avoids disadvantages to U.S. action. Right? Thus, it's preferable as a policy action. The third thing that a counterplan has to do in order to win debates is that it avoids theoretical problems. Right? Maybe you don't want to read it in the 2 and C, because there might be some theory obligation, some theory objections your, the other team can make. Maybe you don't want to read it conditionally, because there might be some theory baggage associated with being able to just say, hey, hey, your counterplan, whenever you want. Okay? Maybe you don't want to read a counterplan that advocates China acting, because maybe you're unsure about whether you can justify a theoretical defense of an international actor doing something. Right? 
Get an A, B, and C in order to win your counter plans. Right? Which segues to the last point. Counter plans, right, can be very complex. Right? They involve actors and actions and theory questions and competition questions, right? That's a lot of stuff that you have to be able to defend. Right? Just like the affirmative has to defend significance, inherency, solvency, top gallery stuff, or to demonstrate that the affirmative is viable and the change is necessary. When you read and want to defend a counterplane, you also have a lot to defend, right? You have to defend its solves. You have to defend that it's competitive. And you have to defend that it's theoretically you know, legitimate, right? Which is similar to what the affirmative has to do. Right? And because of that complexity, and because of those burdens, it oftentimes can be difficult to achieve. And so for young people, I would suggest that you really get comfortable with counterplans before you decide to read them in debates. I think the worst thing you do is just want to like just throw a counterplan out there and not really have the ability to defend it from a theoretical perspective. Right? It's oftentimes easier to just defend the status quo, because it's just like plain plus bad stuff in a simple sort of equation like that. Right? But I'm not saying don't read counterplans, but if you're uncertain about Counterplan competition, counterplan theory, etc. Take some more time to sort of familiarize yourself with those things before you really get into reading counterplan. Okay? The other, another way to negate is to raise philosophical objections against the affirmer. Right? This is known as the critique with the C, the critique with the K, the K, right? And the other manifestation. Okay? This style of argument calls for the rejection of the affirmative due to their use of flawed assumptions about the world around us. Okay? So economic engagement presumes that what can control the behavior of international actors? Eco-economics. Right? <laughs> right? Economic engagement presumes that we can use economics to do what? Get people to do things. Right? And maybe there's something wrong about that assumption, right? Because it's inherently capitalist, or it's inherently neoliberal, or whatever reasons that they might be able to bring up, right? And critiques or criticisms, right, range from the philosophical, capitalism is bad, because it places profit over everything else, that destroys the environment, right? Representational, right? Maybe they stand up and they're like, oh my god, the baby seals die because we have oil spills. Maybe that's really bad, because do we really care about baby seals? No, we just use them as little pawns in like our Coke advertisements, or you know, they merely serve as like lame justifications to support US imperial actions abroad. Okay? Ontological, right, which is sort of like you presume that we have this place in the world, but in reality that we don't. Right? Or you presume that humans are at the center of the world, but in reality, we're just one among many sentient beings. Aliens, plants, dirt, etc. Right? These are pretty gooey, right? They can be pretty vague and pretty nebulous and pretty dense at times. Right? And Rob, when he talks to you on Friday, will get a lot more in depth and a lot more specific to you about the sort of styles of critiques and the various types of critiques that you're likely going to hear on this topic in debates. But regardless, they all have a common theme, right? And they're all philosophical objections to what the affirmative proposes. Right? If you want the affirmative's assumptions about the world are flawed, you can use that as an offensive reason to reject the end. Right? If they perpetuate capitalism and capitalism is bad, it's a reason not to go affirm. Right? If you want that they are ontologically violent because they place humans above other sentient beings in the world and that's bad, you can win you shouldn't have voted affirm. Right? And so, in a sense, they're still in disadvantages because they are still are the plain bad kind of argument at the end of the day. They're just a lot more nuanced, a lot more complex because they involve philosophical issues. Right? And like counterplans, right, they are complex, they are very dense, they deal with all sorts of sort of literatures right, that you might not be super familiar with. And so if you're unsure about what Nietzsche says, or if you're unsure about what Spanos says, or if you're unsure about what capitalism is, let alone why it's bad, you probably want to stay away from these style of arguments so that you aren't going into the debate making arguments that you aren't really prepared to defend. Right? It might be safer to just stick with the status quo is good, shouldn't change it. Right? Or maybe it's a safer bet to stick with, I'm going to read a counterplan because I know that counterplan well, and I think I can articulate why China's better at doing economic engagement with Latin America than the U.S. is. Yeah. Effective negation, starting in the 1NC. Right? 1NC is the first negative speech. Right? And effective negation starts with having a variety of options to choose from. Right? 
Effective ordinances have multiple options to attack the affirmative. Right? Imagine if you stood up, let's say you have practice space later this week. You stood up and you just read the China disadvantage. That's all you said. You didn't make any arguments against the affirmative case. You didn't raise any objections about topicality. You didn't read a counter plan. You didn't read a critique. You only said you make China mad. You really think that's like an effective strategy to win a debate? No, because you have to challenge the affirmative assumptions, right? They still solve it in, in, like, in advance. It's a pretty big deal, right? You have to challenge the ability to, like, any of that stuff, right? And you want to have more than one option, right? Starting in the one and C. You want to have a disadvantage, right? You want to have a defense of the status quo. You want to have a counter plan, right? You want to say that there might be another option that's a better option to pursue than what the affirmative proposes, right? Maybe you should raise a philosophical objection to the app. It's like, hey, it's really bad to securitize our relationship with Latin America. Right? And why would you want to do that? Why would you want to give yourself options starting early in the negative, right, in the one C? So that if the app answers one um, but doesn't answer another, you can use the one they didn't answer against? Exactly, right? More options is good. It gives you choice, right? Maybe they're really good at defending why the status quo is bad. And maybe they really don't have a reason why China can't do the affirmative. Well, because you've given yourself some options, right, in early in the debate, you can then make the necessary adjustments as the debate progresses to maximize the ability of the Right. So starting in the one and C, the first negative speech, you want to have options. You want to have a defense of the status quo, a disadvantage. Right? You want to attack the affirmative, right? make these arguments. You want to read or propose a counter plan, offer an alternative policy option, right? and maybe you want to raise some philosophical objectives. Right? Because options is good. Having options force the affirmative to defend itself from a variety of angles. Right? It's sort of like in football, right? When, uh, when the offense draws up a play, how many times do they just send like one receiver out and everybody else is just kind of like doing their thing? Barely. Right, because like if you only have one receiver, what can the defense do? Nothing. They do a lot of other. Right, they just focus on that one receiver, right? If I know that Chapin is the one receiver and I'm on defense, I'm going to do what with Chapin? Put like four guys on Chapin to make sure he can't catch the ball, right? But offenses don't do that, right? They have three receivers and a running back and a tight end. And why do they have all of those options? So they can take any strike. Exactly. So it's harder for the negative to defend, right? That way it's only one-on-one -on -one matchups, not like four guys versus Shaden, right? Shaden's a badass. He might be able to disguise and catch it and, you know, do his thing like Tavares King. But, you know, maybe not. Right, so having a variety of options is good. It forces you from to defend itself from a variety of angles, and that increases the likelihood that they aren't able to do so effectively. Effective negation for the two and C. Right? The first, the second negative constructor. Right? Smart negative teams will reduce their potential options in the two and C, the one and R, the negative block. Right? You start off with, let's say, four options in the one and C. You want to reduce those options in the negative block. Right? It might be bad for you to have all of those options left in the negative block. Why? Why might it be bad to have too many options in the middle of the debate? Uh, right, so there's you can't develop your arguments that well, right? Every argument requires development, right? Requires time, and if you have too many options in the negative block, right? You might not be able to establish right your positions with any depth, right? You might not be able to develop them sufficiently, right? And so eliminating options allows for you to develop those positions well, right? Argument development is essential, in my opinion, because it is difficult to refute in a form of case. Privilege, disadvantage, etc. Right? If you're trying to do everything at once, sort of like this. Like multitasking in life is difficult. Correct? It's kind of hard to do. Right? If you're asked to, you know, wake up at 7 a.m. and run 30 miles and then eat right a gluten-free breakfast and then you know put in like an eight-hour workday, right? Go home, play with the kids. Walk the dog and the pet tiger, right? <laughs> have vegetarian dinner with quinoa and tofu and kale because it's superfood, right? Watch some, you know, TV, but not like housewives, but like educational stuff, like HGTV or the History Channel, right? Make sure your kids go to bed, but only after you've read them, you know, a proper Nordic bedtime story, right? Does that sound like a fun day? No. No, and it's like a lot to do, right? It's kind of hard to do all of that at once. Likewise, it's kind of hard to balance a ton of options in the middle of a debate, right? None of those can get really developed. And in fact, when you have so many options, there's a chance that you mess something up, right? Maybe you don't answer a theory better than a counter plan. 
or maybe you don't really answer all the arguments of the TOAC made against the critique, right? And so you want to reduce your options so you can sufficiently develop the options that are left in that debate, because argument development is key to winning a disadvantage, winning a counterplay, winning a critique, etc. Okay, shallowness in debates is never a good thing, right? You want to have sufficient number of options, but you want those options to be developed enough so that they become viable options later in the debate, right? And you'll hear me use this sort of phraseology a lot. It's just sort of like a thing. The goal of the negative block, that 13 minutes of time, is maximum destruction, right? What is the most effective way to destroy the affirmative in 13 minutes, right? Is it to go for 17 off-case positions? I mean, maybe that achieves some destruction, right? But I don't think any of those 17 positions will be developed at all, right? So a smart app can just be like, that doesn't make sense, that's illegitimate, that's answered by this evidence. That's the same thing as the fourth option. Right? This is also theoretically legitimate. This double turns itself with the thirteenth option, etc. Right? There's problems with that strategy. Instead, you want to have sufficient options in the middle of the debate, but you want to develop those options effectively, right? So that you can enact as much destruction as possible, right, on the affirmative team. Effective negation block. And we've got that block of time. Right? The first suggestion is to divide up your arguments between the 2 and C and the 1 and R. Now, why does it behoove yourself to divide up positions in the 2 and C and the 1 and R? You don't repeat what you said. You don't repeat what you said. And why do you want to avoid that, Brian? Well, I mean, you just read you say your arguments. Are exactly. Is it really maximum destruction when you blow up the same city you just blew up three days ago? Yeah. No. I just blew up Hiroshima. What, will we need to blow it up again? No. So what am I going to do? Nagasaki, hey, why not blow up that? So that's what they did, right? They oh, just dropped nukes on Nagasaki and then dropped nukes on Nagasaki, right? They dropped nukes on Hiroshima and then they dropped nukes on Nagasaki. Why? Because they wanted to inflict maximum destruction possible to get Japan to do what? Wave the white flag. To give up, right? The same thing applies for you on the negative, right? If you spent eight minutes in the 2 and C making a bunch of arguments in the affirmative case, why would you then in the 1 and R just restate what your partner just said, right? Doesn't make sense, right? If your two and C is really good and it makes a lot of arguments, why not make the one and one and R really good and make a lot of arguments, right? It's easier for you to win debates and to do more destruction if the one AR speech, which happens after the negative block, has to answer thirteen distinct, like thirteen minutes of distinct arguments rather than eight minutes of arguments that the one and R just repeats for five minutes. Okay, thirteen is more than eight. Thirteen is more than five. Thirteen is more than eleven based on the math that I've learned, right? And because of that, you want to make sure that the 13-minute block of time right, has different arguments, because it's a lot harder to answer 13 minutes of stuff in five minutes than it is eight minutes of stuff in five minutes, right? And that's that sort of section about efficiently using your time to pressure the firm team, right? So for example, right, the 2 and C would maybe extend the China disadvantage, right? Talk a little bit about why that's the case, respond to the affirmative answers, right? And Right, continue to attack the affirmative case arguments. Right? There's no chance of oil spills, the environment is resilient, and we can't really destroy it despite what we think. Right? That um, relations with Latin America and Cuba are high now, that cooperation with Cuba doesn't really do anything, um, etc. Right? And then the one in R would take the counterplay, the China counterplay. Right? China should give economic assistance to Cuba, they have sufficient expertise to help them develop their oil sector, blah, 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 blah. Right? That's more. That's a better example of an effective negative block than the two and C taking the China disadvantage, the case arguments, and then one R one R being, hey, I know you just heard this. Like I'm going to talk to you again about the China disadvantage. You just heard like three minutes. Ago. It just doesn't really make much sense, right? You want to want to avoid repeating each other. You want to divide up responsibilities in the negative block. Why? More arguments equals more destruction equals global end. Okay. Or developed arguments, I should say. And slide effects. Effective negation, 2 and R, the last negative speech. Right? Effective negative teams win debates in the 2 and R. Why? It's the line speech. Right? The up and downs don't win debates because the 1 and C was awesome. Oh my god, that was amazing. <laughs> Too bad you have three other speeches that could be terrible. It just doesn't work that way. Right? And teams don't like. Wave the flag and be like, alright, I'm done. One and two is so good, I just can't win. <laughs> I give up. It doesn't happen. 
Right? There is no like team TKO. You can't just be like, oh, all right, we quit. After the one decision. Yeah. No, it doesn't happen. Trust me, sometimes if you're a 1A, sometimes you want to quit after the next one. Yes. Sometimes you're just like, oh my god, how am I going to deal with this? Right? But you don't. Right? You try your hardest, and oftentimes you find a way to win. Right? The two hundred is the last speech. Not, and that's primarily the reason why right, that's how negative teams win debates. But you have to do things up to the 2 and R to make sure that it's right, as effective as it can be. Right? And in my opinion, the 2 and R is arguably the hardest speech in debate. And the reason why is because you have to do two things. Right? You have to do what? Win your arguments. Right? And you have to respond to theirs. Right? Because it's not just enough to prove that the plan is bad. Right? Because the plan could be bad, but it could also be good. Right? And there has to be some comparisons between the two. Right? It's way easier to win in the 2 and R when you can say the affirmative is a bad idea and it doesn't do any. Right? It's way easier the 2 and R to say the plan is a bad idea and our counter plan is better. Okay? You've got a lot to do. Right? You have to respond to the affirmative and you have to defend your decision. And you have to do that in how long? Five minutes. Five minutes. Right? You have to take all of that chaos, right? that preceding hour plus, 1 AC, 1 AC, 2 AC, 2 AC, 1 AR, 1 AR. Make sense of all that in five minutes. It's tough, right? Which is why it's a tough speech in my opinion. The one way to make that 2 AR more manageable is to choose your arguments, right? You can't go for everything that was extended in the negative block in the 2 AR. Simply put, why? Exactly. Like, how long is the negative block? 13 and how long is the 2 and R? 13 equals 5, right? Mm -hmm. No, of course not. Right? It doesn't make sense. Right? So just time reasons, right? You have to make choices. Because 13 does not fit into 5. Square peg, not in our goal. 13 not equal 5. Okay? So you gotta do that. But another reason why is that, right, you have to be able to pick and choose your arguments so you can sufficiently defend your own positions and attack the affirmatives. Right? Choice is key. Choice, choice, choice. Effective two in arms, right, are able to identify the right choices, right, to pick the arguments that really highlight why the affirmative is a bad idea, right, to isolate the arguments that really poke on of the affirmative case and why it doesn't really do anything, right. Choice is key. You have to choose and identify the arguments that you want to use to win, and you have to choose where to focus your time. Tips for making the right choice. Right? Given that choice is important, vitally important. You gotta have some tips to maximize your ability to make the right choice. The first is you gotta have offense. Does defense win championships? No. In football, maybe, but not in debate. Offense does. Right? So in the two in our speech, you have to have offense. Right? You gotta have a, a defense of the status quo. You gotta have a reason why the plan is a bad idea. The two in our has to have a reason why the affirmative is bad. Right? Why is saying the affirmative doesn't do much, Judge. Why is that a reason to not go to affirmative? Okay. There's not, right? Okay, it doesn't do much, but doesn't do something? Yeah, if Probably. They, yeah, if they want to risk it, they could do something. Right. Like if the environment's going to be destroyed in the status quo, and the affirmative does something to minimize that risk, then it seems like there's a reason to go to affirmative. Right? But if the environment might be destroyed now, and you want the affirmative destroys the environment more, should we vote affirmative? No. No, of course not. Because right? if the goal is to protect the environment, and you win the AF destroys the environment, you obviously would not vote affirmative. Right? Offense wins debates, and it needs to be in that tune in our speech. And as we mentioned, offense wins disadvantages, because it's a planned or affirmative bad argument. Topicality, not being topical is bad for debate. Right? Critiques. The AF's assumptions are bad, right? In case terms, right? Drilling is bad for the environment. Or Latin America relations are bad for the world, right? Or giving money to Cuba is counterproductive, right? All those are case terms, right? All those are offensive arguments as well, right? But there's a caveat to that. Why might it be dangerous to only go for plan is bad arguments in the 2 and R? No, you only have. Uh, you have no defense against. Uh, you have no defense to protect. Other points. So, for example, like the Cuba affirmative says what? It has. Does it only have one advantage? No. It's got multiple advantages. 
right? But what happens if you just win, like, hey, drilling is bad for the environment? Does that answer every other aspect of the affirmative? No. No, no right? Because there are other reasons to vote affirmative, right? It helps relations with Latin America, right? It challenges Chinese hegemony in the region, right? And so even if you win, that the plan hurts the environment, the affirmative team can win, but we help relations with Latin America, and we prevent China from being awful, right? And so how do you resolve those things? Two out is one, maybe. Right? Maybe it's more important to prevent China from being awful than it is protecting the environment. Who knows? But in general, you got to have a mixture of offense and defense in the negative. Right? you got to be able to say the affirmative is a bad idea, and the affirmative doesn't do what it says it does. That combination is key. Right? Right? Or you can say the AF is bad, and there's something else we should do instead to address the problems that they've raised. Tips continue. If you're going for topicality in the last <coughs> negative speech, you should only go for topicality. 98% of it. Okay? T is like all or nothing. Okay? You don't want to do a little bit of T, sprinkle with a little bit of disad, sprinkle with a little bit of fatigue, right? Sprinkle with a lot of case. It's not a good idea. Right? Choice is key. Right? And argument development is key. And if you're going for top you oftentimes you need to take that and only that in the two and R. Right? Why? One, top is an argument that requires a lot of development, right? You have to explain your definitions and interpretation. You have to explain why they don't need that definition or interpretation. You have to explain why your definition or interpretations are good for debate. Right? And you have to explain why they should lose the debate. Because they're in your top cowl. They are top. Right? Some people are like pretty affirmative friendly and like aren't really that ready to pull the trigger, like vote on top cowl the arguments. Right? You have to do a lot of work to demonstrate that the affirmative is not top goal and why they should lose that debate. Right? And so top cowl, right, usually requires you to spend all that time, so sufficiently developed your arguments that you can win that debate on top cowl. If you're going for a counterclaim, right? You need a counterclaim with a net benefit. Right? It's not just sufficient to say but China can do that too, yo. Right? Because if the US can do something well, and China can do something well, why is that a reason not to do the US can do something well? It's not. Right? You could do both. But you haven't given a reason why China is better at doing something than the United States is. Right? And that's what you have to have with the counter plan. Right? How do we choose between the United States and China? Presumably, we choose the one that is better. Right? And so when you offer a China counter plan, right, you also have to win the US doing something is bad. You gotta have net benefit. Right? It's not enough to say that you have something that is just as good. You have to say you've got something that is better than what the affirmative offers. So your two and R has to have both an alternative option and reasons why the affirmative option is disadvantageous. If you're going for the disadvantage, you also need to refute parts of the affirmative case. We already talked a little bit about this tie, right? Right? You can't just go for your disadvantage. You can't just go for, hey, they hurt the economy, yo. Right? It's got to be, they hurt the economy and they don't solve for environmental problems. Right? They hurt the economy and they don't increase relations with Latin America. Right? The path of least resistance, right? The path most conducive to success when you're going for a disadvantage, right, is a path that also involves case rate. Right? It's Chapin and all the LRAs and me back when I debated in the Stone Age can attest. Right? If your 2 and R only involves a disadvantage, it's hard to win that debate alone. Right? Your 2 and R is way more effective when you have a disadvantage in conjunction with attacks against the affirmative case. Right? They result in a bad consequence and they don't solve any good stuff. That's an effective 2 and R. Right? It's right. Right? You have to be able to identify those choices right there. If I'm going to go for a disadvantage, I also need to have some case records. When you're going for a critique, you also probably need to take that for all five minutes of the two and R. Why might that be the case? Because Right, so critiques especially require lots of argument development, right? They're intellectually dense, they're complex, right? It's not just like a yes no question most of the time, there's a lot of nuance and explanation required. Right? And because of that, 
right? It will likely take all five minutes to really execute properly. So if you're going to go for capitalism is bad, or an environment-based critique, or you know, anthropocentrism, or like whatever other variations of critiques, they oftentimes require lots of time to develop, right? And that's just developing your arguments, let alone responding to the arguments the affirmative team has made in the debate. And because of all that work, critiques require all five minutes, much like Doc Cali does. Other tips. Consult your partner. Why would you, as a two-in, want to consult your partner about what to do in the last big of speech? Because You're the one giving the speech, right? They have lots of yeah, and they have stuff that they Think about it in more basic terms. Are you just like debating on your own? No. No, you're not an LD. So you have a partner. Right? And they exist not to just like breathe your air. Right? They exist because they want to win as well. They are a part of your individual team. And they do things like Flora said, they flow. They have an active record of the debate. Yeah. Right? Presumably they've taken arguments that you have deemed important enough for them to take during certain speech times. Yeah. Right? And maybe they have a viewpoint that's different than yours. Right? When I was a young debater and I was a 2N, I had tunnel vision. Right? Everything I took in the 2NC I thought was so important that it had to be in that last negative speech. Why? It's just the way it was. Well, I took in the 2NC, I'm the 2NR, obviously it's got to be there. Right? Well, that tunnel vision is a problem that affects a lot of people. Right? And it basically means that the one in our speech isn't really utilized at all. Right? So you got to be able to consult your partner. Get their thoughts. Right? Maybe it just needs to be like, hey, they didn't answer the position that I took for my entire five-minute speech. It's good to know from a partner perspective. Right? But it could also be your partner's just like, hey, they've got really good answers against this, and I'm not sure we can win this. If you need to hear that from your partner as well, so that you can just be like, all right, well, I feel pretty good about what I took in the two and see, so I'll just take that and tune them out again. Right? You have a partner. It's a team activity. Your partner is probably pretty smart and capable, and you should rely on them for an additional viewpoint. Remember, choice is tough. And oftentimes, you aren't sure about what the right choice is. So why not consult your partner to help you get more information, to inform yourself, and to increase the likelihood that you make the right choice. Another tip, predict the 2AR. Who's psychic? Diane, is that? Who's Katie? Be honest. You're psychic, right? So am I. Right? So it's pretty easy for me to predict what happens in the base. JK. Right, we can't, right? We can't accurately predict what happens, but can we make educated guesses on what we think the other team is going to say? Yeah, yeah like exactly. <laughs> right? So if you're giving the 2 in our speech, you can. Give an educated guess, or have a hunch as to what you think that last firm speech will be about, and then do what? Right. Adjust your speech accordingly, right? If you know the 2AR is going to be all about why the environment is important and why we need to do cooperative oil development with Cuba to protect the environment, right? That is probably important to know for your 2 r speech so you can preempt that discussion. You can be like, hey, they're going to stand up and they're going to talk about the environment. And they're going to talk about why we got to cooperate with Cuba in order to protect it. But guess what? Drilling destroys the environment, right? There's no way we can ever protect it, cooperating with Cuba. And our disadvantage turns the environment. Because a war with China would probably do a lot of environmental damage. Right? That's a way more effective tool in our speech because you guessed and previewed effectively what you think that last speech is going to be about. And the best two in ours have that hunch. They just sort of smell what they think the 2IR is going to go for, and they give their speech in light of that guess. Now, sometimes it's the wrong guess, right? But oftentimes it's right. And if you paid attention throughout the entire debate, and if you've consulted your partner, right, you can have a very good idea of what you think that last affirmative speech is going to be about, and make the necessary adjustments, and make the right choices in your 2 and our speech to give an effective speech. Now, take some practice. And it takes some, you know, foresight, you can do it. Lastly, most important tip, practice, 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 right? Practicing the negative, whether it be a 1 in C or a 2 in C or a 2 in R, is the best way to get better at it. How do you get more effective at debating? You debate. How do you get more effective at speaking? You speak. How do you get more effective at research? You research. 
right? And how do you get more effective at making strategic choices on the negative? You practice making making strategic choices, right? So you can do things like put together Mach one and C's and read them and to see how they play out, right? You can put together a Mach two AC and give it two and C against it, right? You can even have a practice making a block, right? Or you can do what we're going to start doing later this week is to have practice debates where you give practice speeches to sort of maximize your ability to make the right strategic choice, whether it be in the two and C, whether it's one and R, or the two and R, or even in what to include in the one and C, right? Practice makes perfect, or practical perfect, I actually can say, right? The more speeches you give, the more you think about it, the more you sort of envision a world in which you have to make these strategic choices, the more effective you will be at making them, right? Being negative isn't easy, right? It's a lot to deal with. There's a lot of complexities, there's lots of contingencies, right? If you don't think about it, and if you don't practice making those choices, it's going to be hard to pick up. Not everybody is born as an awesome, awesome negative debater. It requires a lot of work, right? And you've got to practice those things <coughs> in a variety of ways in order to get better at making those choices. Okay? Questions? No? Well, if you do, you know, feel free to talk to your lab leaders and stuff. You know, in lab later today. But the name is important, right? You gotta be able to envision the choice that you need to make to win those debates. And if you do, you'll have success on that. Okay? Cool. All right, so take uh, like a 10 minute break or so, go get some water, go get some coffee if you're struggling this morning. Right? But be back here at about 10 10, right? And you'll hear a lecture on this. Right? And I'll tell you, it's pretty teched out and fancy, so prepare yourselves for some awesome. Chapin, do you and Kevin know how to get the, the stuff to work? I don't think so. Huh? I don't think so. Okay, here, I'll show you real quick. Good, it should be pretty easy. You should just be able to hook this up. You want to put it in. Um, but if things are messed up, you just go to the computer and you make sure it's on there because it's a really laptop. Okay, because that's what you plug in. Um, but that's fine. When you're done, you just basically get like projector screen and turn it off. So you went to computer and then we're done with the Yep. Yep. And you put this sort of back in the back. Yeah. Okay.